Pardon the interruption, but I'm Mike Wilbon. Tony, police on Long Island are searching for three people who robbed a convenience store of $640 worth of ice cream. I'm Tony Kornheiser. You in reality stole it. I just ate it. That's yeah, all. right. Let me tell you something. That actually happened. My father would be rolling over in his grave. My father sold ice cream. Dean's Food Company. Sold dairy, ice cream. For years. Is that right? Yeah. That's great. That's just sort of set up. What's your favorite flavor ice cream? Vanilla. What's your, what's your favorite flavor ice cream? Vanilla. Vanilla? Oh, how mine is, boring mine is, coffee. Western is that? What's yours? Mine is coffee. 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 Could you ever I have like McConnell's coffee. Brazilian coffee? No. It's fabulous. It is. It's great. It's I'm exotic. telling you. Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. In today's episode, Rick Pitino apologizes. Nick Saban wants to change college football and Lionel Messi gets the MLS season off on the right foot. But we begin today with the resumption of the NBA, other than LeBron James, who is sitting out to rest his ankle, but I digress. There will be 12 games tonight, including the league-leading Boston Celtics playing in Chicago. If, if the playoffs were to start today, the top seeds would be Boston and Minnesota. Wilbon, are they the teams you feel most confident in? Tony, yes, but you, you hear my voice. I'm hedging a little bit. Because I think in terms of right. regular season, they're going to finish with the one seeds, although Minnesota is going to be challenged by Oklahoma City and Denver and the Clippers. But, I, but I'm okay with Minnesota finishing number one in the regular season. And Boston, certainly. I don't know about the playoffs, Tony. And even Boston, you point, you make the case that the Celtics are potentially a great team and Tatum is potentially MVP. I'm not going to argue with you there, but this intention yeah. of just shooting 53s a game, I don't like that in May and June when you've got Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, and you're limiting them. You are limiting them when you're saying, we're just going to stand out here and shoot threes. I'm worried about that. And Minnesota's young, and I don't think they've had their hearts crushed enough, and so I worry about that. Right. And I think Denver still. So if you make me pick, I'll say, okay, Boston I'll go with, because I don't know who's going to challenge them in the East. Philly, not without him, not with questions about Embiid. Milwaukee looks like they're too far away trying to figure out what they're doing. Who else in the East? The Knicks? Eh. So I'll say Boston, but I think Denver, I'm going to take over Minnesota because I take them in a series. I have a lot of confidence. I have utmost confidence in Boston okay. right now. They're much better than they were last year. They brought in Kristaps Porzingis, who's averaging 20 a game. They brought in Drew Holiday, who's doing everything they, they need to be done. And whoever isn't there anymore does not matter. And I have a lot of confidence in a player who I think and who he thinks is the best <laughs> player in the league, Jason Tatum. Because he has said that recently. Has. I think he has more positive impact on his team than any other player. I don't have as much confidence in Minnesota, even though, as you know, because of their coaching staff, I root you for like them. You like them. I know you do. My position is, you know, that, that they are the team that you have to beat, but I think teams can beat them. I agree with you about Denver. I also think that Phoenix can beat him, and I agree with you that you have to get your heart broken most of the time in order, in order to be great. Yeah. What Minnesota has done, Mike, is they have the luxury of being able to have a great regular season and not do great in the playoffs because it's their first time around. It would be nice if they won a playoff series, which they haven't done from 2004, but Boston, if they don't win the whole thing, it will, it will seem disappointing because yeah. they've been so close. No, Tony, Boston should win. Boston Ought to win. Yeah. They've got it all set up to win. I agree. I, so, listen, I didn't think that was going to be the case in October when this whole thing started. You did. I know you did. I give you credit for that. Your team's mm. on course. The West is hard. It's hard. It's going to be a minefield out there. And I don't know that Minnesota's ready to navigate that. And now we go to college basketball, where Rick Pitino was trying to walk back the criticism he leveled at his own team. After beating Georgetown last night, Patino told reporters he has apologized to his players for calling them out by name Sunday. He said he told them he loves them and would never want to embarrass them, adding, quote, these guys have never failed me. I have failed them with the fundamentals. Close quote. Tony, what does Patino's about face now say to you? First of all, let me say that it is a great and thorough apology. Patino took full responsibility for embarrassing his kids. He said he should never have named them by name. And he said, I recruited all of them and I love them. This is on me. It's on my watch. And, and that's a lovely 
sentiment. And I think it's fair to ask, what took you so long? <laughs> OK, because the day after it happened, he talked about the fact that he hadn't really been critical of him. And he and stood he by pretty much yeah. everything he said. I'm going to delve into a, an area here that I don't know as much about as you do because you are the product of a, of a high school Catholic education, and, and I am not. But I think this about face, what it says to me is that the good fathers at St. John's University in Queens, New York, spoke to Rick Pitino. And they said, we can't have this. This is no good. You should not have done that. We stand for something bigger and better than this. We took you in and gave you the reins at a historically important college basketball team. Don't embarrass us like this and don't embarrass yourself. And then I believe Rick Pitino thought about this and he said to himself, hmm, I could lose this job and I don't want to because I can win here. That's, if you're asking me what I think, that's what I think. That's interesting, Tony. And yes, I'm a product of that um, environment, that culture. And Rick Pitino before that was at Providence College. So he, so he understands the environment. I don't know that anybody had to go to him. Rick has been in that similar environment, those kinds of environments for a lot of time in his college coaching career. And yeah, you can have casual conversations and people can walk down the hallways as they do. And they say, you know, you know, coach. And I think that Rick would have had some self-reflection. I mean, Rick Patino has been a great coach for a long time and he knows he hurt those That's kids right. feelings. He didn't have to canvas yep. the room. He knew he hurt them. So I was glad to see this, even if it was a couple of days late, Tone. I was glad to see it. I think it was necessary. He still says, I didn't rip Me anybody. Too. Yeah, you did rip them. Just stop No, it. yeah, you did. You did. Here's the thing, Mike. Rick has to realize now, as you and I have to realize now, it's not 1986 no, anymore. No, it's not. Players are not just happy if you give them a scholarship. You don't have that power anymore as a coach. It does not exist. And, and there's not a basketball kid in this country who hasn't seen this clip already. And is saying to himself, do I want to do play I for this go guy? play for him? No. Right. Do I want, do exactly. I want him to do that? Right? Yeah. Yes. Right. All right. Completely we move agree. on. Another great coach, Nick Saban, spoke yesterday about the state of college football. He worries about the lack of continuity on teams because of the transfer portal. He worries that NIL money is becoming the goal and detracting from going to college to prepare for a career other than football. He says he's for the players and wants what sounds like compensation to be paid directly from the school to the players. Saban doesn't like these collectives that have sprung up, doesn't like them at all. Well, does Saban have the sway to get everyone on the same page? Tony, I don't know if he has the sway because college football supporters, boosters, are maniacs. I'm one of them. I, 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 so I'm accusing a group that I'm included in. I have had a brief conversation uh, with Nick Saban about this general area. Others have had longer conversations. I know he feels this way, and I agree with every syllable he spoke. Every syllable, all of it, all of it. The NIL portion, the transfer portion, the, the college football is, I worry, I'd go even further. It seems to me it's going to hell in the handbasket, even though it's so popular, it's right. more popular, and more people are coming into the tent. I worry about where it's going when you have entire regions who aren't really represented anymore. Let's just move this off the West Coast and go to the SEC and the Big Ten. I, I worry about all of it, and I think Nick Saban is a thousand percent right. Mm -hmm. Now, let's get to the specifics of the question. Does he have the sway? Man, Tony, his argument is compelling. I think it's necessary. If there is anybody, Nick Saban's the guy. I just don't know that people are listening, Tone. College football boosters don't yeah. listen to much of anyone. They do their own thing. They want these collectives. They're not trying to abide by any new rules. And I don't know if even the great Nick Saban can sway them. So when I heard these quotes this morning, my first reaction was that ship, this ship had sailed already. That Nick Saban was, you know, when, when the ship moved out, right. Nick Saban was on the ship, and then he jumped off back to the dock, <laughs> and then he quit. Okay, and he quit because the new world order in college football is something that, that he cannot abide. Right. And we have friends who are college basketball coaches who in the last three to five years have gotten out too. And this is a common thing among older coaches who've had a certain amount of power. I don't specifically disagree with what Nick Saban has said generally. I think it's great to plan for a career other than football. But I would say this, Mike, that when Nick Saban recruited people to Alabama, he said, come to Alabama because you can go to the NFL from here. He didn't say come to Alabama because we got a great med school. Okay. So I, I like the message. I'm not sure I completely trust the messenger in this particular case. When Nick Saban says he's for the players, 
I'm not doubting that, but I think he's more for the coaches, Mike. I think he sees people who do what he did for so long that the, their power has changed. It has dissipated. And I think he is mostly empathetic with that of a group to the NFL at some point. They're not going there. And they're going to, Tony, forget, and Saban, I think, said specifically by the time they're 27, 28 years old. No, by the time they're 22. Because even some of the ones that go to the NFL, they're there two, three years. That's it. So they're not all going to Alabama. And Nick, Nick Saban understands that. And, Tony, I think he also understands that while he and their slightly younger guy, I mean, Dabo Sweeney doesn't want to abide by some of this stuff either. The younger coaches, Tony, I think Nick Saban knows this. They're okay with it. They have grown up yeah. expecting yeah, different right. things out of college football and the culture that's that right. it is. And I think he that's gets right. that. I just, it, just, it feels to me, Mike, like a battlefield conversion. It feels like, oh, mm. let me think about this for a second. Because he's the greatest coach ever, and he got paid the most money when players weren't making any money. Yeah. Okay? Let's take a break. Coming up, the college football playoff has not even played with 12 teams yet. They're already considering 14. And how special is the season that Austin Matthews is putting together? I'd like to see Saban as like the commissioner of college football, a three-year appointment. I mean, I don't think he would is do there anything such a that thing? would hurt college football. Is there Saban. such a job? No, he loves college. It's time for toss-up. Two men enter, one man leaves, finishes the show, then wonders why he's still feeling the Novocaine he had injected into his mouth nine hours ago. What's gas. first? Toss up, who's on the more impressive heater right now? Alex Ovechkin or Austin Matthews? So it's very tempting for me to say Ovechkin. I live in Washington, D.C. I've watched him play for the last 15 years. He's a folk hero in town. And he's chasing Gretzky, which is a great thing to be doing at this stage in your career. And he's got eight goals in eight games, and that's a true heater. The other guy's got 21 goals in his last 18 games. And mathematically, that is way ahead of Alexander Ovechkin. The other guy is on pace to have 76 goals, I believe, which hasn't been done since 1993. Ovechkin's on pace for 25, which 80,000 people have done, and which he usually does by December. So the answer is Austin Matthews. The answer is Austin Matthews. It is. And by the way, I mean, Toronto, Tony, they need everything Austin Matthews can give them because they're only in fifth in the East. And there's some hot teams suddenly in the East, like the Rangers. I know Boston had cooled off. They won last night. I mean, you know, the Panthers. I mean, there, there, there's some, some teams in the East saying, let's go. And so, you know, I want to see Toronto Edmonton. That's the Stanley Cup final. I want to see. To do that, Austin Matthews has got to lead that. And he has been on a heater, and they need everything he can throw out there. He's the answer. It's going to be interesting to see how long Ovechkin, at an advanced age in hockey, you know, can keep right. this up yeah, because sure. the Capitals, if they're going to move up in the standings to get to a playoff spot, they're going to need Ovechkin to carry them like Austin Matthews can and is carrying o Toronto. Ovechkin, Ovechkin's a great, great goal scorer, but he never had 70, right? No, he never had 70. No. He never had what Austin Matthews is you looking go at. Back to, to he never Alexander had that. Alexander McGillney and Tamu Solani. That was a long time Solani. ago, early 90s. Next. Toss next, up. Next, next, next. How do you like your college football playoff? 12 teams or 14 teams? This is incredible to me. They haven't even done 12, and they're agitating for 14. Your conference, the Big Ten, is leading the charge here because they want automatic qualifiers. Yeah, and the reason the Big Ten wants automatic qualifiers is because if you pick teams by choice and, and not – by some sort of rule, the Big Ten is afraid that the SEC will get eight teams in there. I understand that. I hate 14. I hate 12. Yep. Mike, this thing is going to go on for an eternity. It's going to become the NBA playoffs. Eight, kids. Eight. That's the right thing. The way it looks now, it, it, it's unwieldy, and it looks terribly greedy. Really greedy. Tony, you might think I'm going to disagree. But what did, we just say? what did I just say about college football people? and the boosters and the people affiliated with conferences. Again, I'm one of them. It's total greed. The Big Ten ought to be ashamed, but there's no shame. The Big Ten doesn't need four automatic bids. There are never four teams in our conference worthy of going to this stupid playoffs. I hate 14. I hate 12. And I'm going to one-up you and tell yeah. you I hate eight. Four teams oh. is enough. 
<laughs> Tony, it's going to be like the, 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 the 64 in the NCAA tournament. They're going to have play-in games in Dayton pretty soon. This is awful. D Tony, the Big Ten and the SEC are going to ruin college football as you and I prefer it. I They're love it. your idea. I love your idea. The first four in Dayton. I love that. That would be tremendous if they played in Dayton. It's awful. Just like the NCAA Terrible. basketball. It Terrible. So great. Unless Northwestern is one it. of them. Then we can have four. Well, that's different, of that course. Case. That's God's way of saying things are good. Let's take one last break, but still to come. The Mets have an issue with their ace. And how impressive was Lionel Messi on opening night for MLS? Come on, 14. Come Again, on. the brilliance of the marketing people putting him in a pink jersey. How about the how marketing pink people in college sold football? Around the world? You like them right now? Well, no, you don't. They're going a little crazy. <laughs> Again, <laughs> it'll stretch into June. It'll go to June. What are we Happy time, people. Happy 33rd birthday, Khalil Mack. Mack started with the Raiders as the fifth overall draft pick. 2014 out of the University of Buffalo. In Mack's four years in Oakland, he made three Pro Bowls and was twice All-Pro. He was the Defensive Player of the Year in 2016. Then he was traded to the Bears, where he played four seasons, made three Pro Bowls, and was All-Pro twice. Then the Bears traded Mack to the Chargers, where he has played two seasons and made two Pro Bowls. Last season, he had 17 sacks, including six in one game against one of his former teams, the Raiders announced he would change the team name from Washington Bullets to Washington Wizards out of concern that Bullets was unnecessarily violent. Washington, D.C., like many American cities then and now, suffering from gun violence. It was a well-meaning gesture, but the team has been terrible ever since. They've made the playoffs just nine times in 27 ensuing seasons. They've won only four playoff series. They haven't reached the conference finals. This season, they're not making the playoffs. They're 9 and 45. Mm. They've lost 25 of their last 30. And the current owner is trying to move them to Virginia, which is villainy. Yeah, but that's not going to happen. They're not going to Virginia. Tony, here's a question. We know about the Washington football name change, and that's just, that had to be. Would you right. favor a change back to Bullets? You're Washington, you live in the city. What do you believe? I don't, I don't think you can do that. Okay. I think once you've changed, you can find something different, but I don't think you can go back to the old name because you're going to try to recreate a past that is, it's, it's not recreatable at this point. It's a different owner. It's a different everything. But they are terrible, Mike. I used to joke that they they're started bad. every season 9, nine and, and 20. 20. Now they're 9 and 45. It's bad. What? Happy trails to last night's game against LSU for number 17, Kentucky. LSU's Tyrell Ward made the most of a desperate situation, hit a floater just before the buzzer to beat Kentucky 75-74. It came about when Kentucky blocked a driving shot by Jordan Wright, but Wright was able to push the ball in front of the rim where Ward caught it and shot it. LSU fans, including basketball star Angel Reese, stormed the court. LSU was behind by as many as 15 points in the second half. In their previous game on Saturday, LSU was behind by 16 points and came back to beat Number 11, South Carolina, also by one point. Tony Ward, who won that game for LSU, he's from right here in the DMV. I believe he went to DeMatha. The kid who put Kentucky ahead, Rob Dillingham, I mean, he's a great player, and you think Kentucky's going to win the game on that shot. Not so fast. Some good basketball last night. A lot of close finishes. Calipari said after the game, it's a 50-50 ball, and they got it, and we didn't. He True. was upset with that. Accurate one omission. Position. The misdemeanor assault charges against Pistons center Isaiah Stewart for hitting Sun center Drew Eubanks in a pregame altercation have been dismissed, but the NBA has suspended Stewart three games. NBA's got to stop that stuff. You can't have altercations in tunnels and at the bus. No, no, no. no. Just like we said earlier, this is not the 1980s or 90s. You can't have these That's things. Right. A, bigger, a bigger suspension would have been fine, too. Let's go to the big finish Let's if we it. could. Lionel Messi. Had an assist as Inter Miami beat Real Salt Lake in last night's MLS opener. Are you impressed? No, it's the opener. That's what they're supposed to do. When we get a little further into the season, it'll be time to be impressed. Mets ace, Kadai Singa, is likely to start the season on the injured list. You concerned with that? 
He's their ace. He's 12 and 7 with a 2.98 ERA. What happens to pitchers when they go to the Mets? What happens to everybody Ooh. when they go to the Mets? Ooh. Tim Anderson and the Miami Marlins are in agreement on a one-year, five million dollar contract. Is that a good fit? I don't know. He Anderson was supposed to be the catalyst for a White Sox team that catapulted up the standings and win a division and get to the postseason. No, I don't. Know. Falcons running back B. John Robinson says he wants 2,000 rushing yards next season. You like his chances? He had 976 this season. He wasn't even actually he halfway play, there. They got a new coach. They're going to get a new quarterback. Yep. It depends on the quarterback yep. they get. Last one for the top six women's team in action tonight. Just knowing any upset. Just one, Tony. Number four, Iowa. I know they're great. You tune in to watch Caitlin Clark. I'm going to do that. But they're going down in Bloomington to number 14 in Indiana. I'm just saying. We're out of time. We will try and do better the next time. I'm Tony Kornheiser. And I'm Mike Wilbon. We are on the deuce again tomorrow, knuckleheads. You can get the PTI.